Welcome to the Black Marriage and Family Therapy Matters podcast, where we connect black families to black therapists. On Mondays, you will receive direct therapeutic support from a licensed therapist or professional connected to the mental health field. They will provide therapeutic and educational resources to help you have a healthier relationship with your family members. On Wednesdays, you will receive direct tips and resources to help you get through the stuck places that prevent many people from having the relationships with their families and significant others that they desire. On Fridays, we want you to visit our blog, which can be found at www.blackmftmatters.com, which holds additional resources and action steps that you can begin implementing immediately to improve your relationships. This is necessary because we love that you are listening, but we want you to take action too. While you are there, please grab our A to Z relationship bootcamp and be provided with the skills you need to immediately communicate better within your relationships. Please note that while the therapists on podcasts are therapists, they do not serve as your therapist unless you have signed a confidential agreement with them confirming that relationship. Thank you in advance for listening and we hope you are inspired. All right, it's time for the show. Here is your host, Dr. Connie Omari. Hey, 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 welcome to the Black Marriage and Family Therapy Matters podcast, where we connect Black families to Black therapists. All right, we have a special therapist with us today. She is a longtime friend and a colleague that I have worked with before in the past, and we are so blessed to be able to share her with you today. Her name is Danielle McDowell. Hi, Danielle. Hey, thanks for having me. You are very welcome. We are so honored to have you here today. Danielle is a self-described warrior who shares her experiences from being broken and confused to a successful resident in counseling, advocate, best-selling author, and speaker. She's a former high school teacher and mental health professional. Danielle has channeled her passion for empowering others through coaching and counseling them to identify their assets and uncover their inner warrior mindset. An intuitive and results-oriented leader herself, Danielle engages and leads her clients through dynamic and interactive, interactive transformations. She's devoted to working with adolescents, adults, and couples from all walks of life. As a mother of three, she knows firsthand the difficulties that individuals face while managing their responsibilities while accomplishing personal goals. With a commitment to serve, she offers the community wisdom, encouragement, and supportive resources to help individuals meet their goals using a transparent approach. Her playful delivery style allows for individuals to gain wisdom without all the seriousness. She prides herself in relaying a message to her clients that's easily understood and provides real solutions to everyday problems. Danielle aims to create a safe and non-judgmental therapeutic environment and welcomes her free expression and exploration. She maintains a collaborative approach and encourages her clients to remain curious as they work to achieve their goals. Oh my God, Danielle, if I didn't already know you, I would want to know you by reading that bio. Uh, thank you, you. Thank you. I worked really hard. Good. Well, well, good. <laughs> but you also work hard in your life to be all of that. I do. I do. And I think I was definitely led by God to be, be in this work. And uh, I, did, I don't do this work lightly. Mm -hmm. So i um, very passionate about helping other families just because I've had that own help in my own okay. family and for myself. Very good. So Very good. Well, I appreciate that. And I've said this before on the podcast, and I know I'll say it in the future. One, I love the way m the counselors who come on this show allow God to use them and place them in a mm -hmm. people. But I love the transparency because as a therapist myself who's committed to this work, I don't see how people can come out here and do this if they're not willing to go through it themselves. I agree. Yeah, and your approach is so personable that it seems very welcoming. So, yeah, so, so as you know, you know, I wanna to talk to you today and I think I was telling you this before we started, this conversation, this topic makes me nervous, girl. 
because it's so <laughs> it's personal. I'm not gonna lie. I am an adult survivor of sexual trauma. Um, people who follow me, people who have been in my work, know this. But we got a problem in the black community <laughs> with this yeah. stuff. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, most definitely. So many layers. Mm-hmm. 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 What does that mean? So when you think about trauma, you just m- mentioned sexual trauma. Mm-hmm. But there's so many other types of trauma and layers, like generational mm-hmm. trauma. So when you talked about the topic and you gave me the word trauma, there's so many different things. Mm-hmm. Complex trauma, mm-hmm. the, the toxic stress behind different things. Mm-hmm. So it, it's big. It's like a big thing. And it's difficult to talk about in a few minutes mm-hmm. of a podcast. Yeah. And I'm hoping that we're able to tap into some of the information that Black families can use so that they can see that there is hope and there's help and there are resources and there are things you can do mm-hmm. if you're experiencing trauma. Mm-hmm. Gosh, Danielle, you know, I'm a clinician, you're a clinician, we've been trained for this stuff, mm-hmm. but a lot of our audience has not. So mm-hmm. what is trauma? So trauma is stress, but it's like a toxic level of stress. So we all experience stress. Stress, we tend to think stress is bad. But stress is not bad. Having stress is not bad because you can be anxious about getting married, Mm -hmm. right? Yes. And that provides a little bit of stress. That doesn't mean it's bad. But then there are other situations where the stress can be at toxic levels and it can cause trauma. Mm -hmm. It can also be thing that happened to you. So like, for instance, you mentioned about sexual abuse Mm -hmm. and that was an experience that caused something traumatic in your life. Mm -hmm. So when I think about trauma, I think about either a thing or stressor that's affecting your functioning in life. Okay. And your ability to function. Okay. Okay. A fear of life that affects your ability to function. In your practice, is Mm -hmm. there a form of trauma or a form of functioning that you see more often than other that others that people might need to look out for? Well, well typically I see a lot of childhood trauma, mm-hmm. things that happen in childhood mm-hmm. that uh, are affecting families. Mm-hmm. So parents are being affected about th- by things that happened to them when they were young mm-hmm. children mm-hmm. and they're bringing that into their adult experiences. And then their kids are now being affected mm-hmm. by things that have happened to them. And I can't speak to it being just like one specific thing, but individuals who have experienced like really bad poverty, Mm -hmm. um, stressful environments where there was abuse in the home, Mm -hmm. be it physical abuse or emotional abuse, and bringing those different experiences into their own families and it becoming a generational thing. Mm -hmm. So mom experienced it, grandma experienced it, And now I have this teenage daughter in my office that is hurting from things that happened years and years Mm -hmm. ago, but it's trickling down to her. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and so I see a lot of that with families that I'm working with currently here in the Hampton Roads area. And what makes it hard? Like, what makes it hard for people, one, to recognize that this is trauma And two, to prevent the trauma from being passed on from one generation to the next. Well, I I think part of it is the education piece. And when we speak specifically to the Black community, Mm -hmm. there are some barriers for the Black community when it comes to mental health support. Mm -hmm. And a couple of those barriers are... Please, I was like, please tell us what these barriers (laughs) are. (laughs) Are... are the lack of resources for someone that's competent. Okay. And so when I say competent, we, we need more black therapists mm-hmm. who can connect and be competent and help support our black families yes. because we have a unique experience. And I know that there are courses where other individuals, other therapies, other therapists of other ethnicities can go take this course and learn our experience. But sometimes I feel it's a little bit more deeper than just the textbook. Mm -hmm. And so when I have Black families come in, I can relate to them in a way that uh, another person of another ethnicity may not be able to relate Mm -hmm. to them for a shared experience. So I think that's part of it. And also resources. So having families who 
have limited resources and feeling like they don't have the money Uh for the support they need. Uh So some of my clients come in and they they can use things like Medicaid Uh to cover. But if they need like couples therapy, Uh Medicaid is not covering no couples therapy. Right, right. (laughs) And there are limitations to some of the insurance policies that lower income people can use to seek out the service and then there are limited services available Mm -hmm. and that's just one piece of the puzzle the other piece is the distrust that black families have when it comes to mental health support and they have valid reasons Mm -hmm. because historically Mm -hmm. when individuals of color would seek out support that could mean that they were hospitalized girl preach it Mm -hmm. yes or it could mean um that they were sterilized Mm -hmm. and um just unfairly diagnosed Mm -hmm. unfairly treated Mm -hmm. and we still have some of that in our community today not to the same significance Mm -hmm. but we are still seeing trends of black individuals being diagnosed incorrectly more often Mm -hmm. with things like uh adhd i see that so much in Mm -hmm. little black boys yeah they're just little black boys. they're just being little boys Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. so i understand the barriers i'm hopeful to be a change agent in my small way mm-hmm. to help black families feel safe mm-hmm. to know that I'm I'm a therapist who gets it mm-hmm. and I'm a therapist who cares and I'm also a therapist who has utilized the service so I'm mm-hmm. not telling people to go do something that I haven't had to experience for mm-hmm. myself because like you I have a shared experience yes. of sexual trauma mm-hmm. uh, oh, thank you for sharing had, thank you I had a daughter that struggled with mental health things mm-hmm. and we've had to utilize these services to help heal ourselves absolutely so when i go speak and i educate my community i speak very transparently from a space of i've used it so i'm not telling you to do something that i don't know firsthand i'm not speaking from a textbook i'm speaking Mm -hmm. from experience Mm -hmm. too and that's helpful but we definitely have those barriers in place and I sound very passionate about this, so you don't have to just be like, okay. No, girl, yeah. keep it keep it coming. Keep it coming because we need to hear this. I want to piggyback off of something you just said because I think it was very powerful. In my practice, and I'm not going to lie, in my personal life, when mm-hmm. certain traumatic events have happened, such as sexual abuse, a lot of the mm-hmm. language that I hear and have received was, well, it happened to me. And Mm -hmm. you just said, and and, you know, you can share as much about this as you're comfortable with, but you said you are a survivor of sexual trauma. And then you said your daughter's had her mental health challenges, but you Mm -hmm. got her help. You did not say, well, well, even if you said, well, it happened to me, it was comma, but I'm going to help you. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like what needs to start to be able to break the cycle, to break the pattern. So can you tell our listeners a little bit more about how to get from, well, it happened to me, because we agree that this is a generational thing. It's happened to a lot of our parents and grandparents and great grandparents. <laughs> but the point is, what, when, how did the light bulb go off in your head that says it stops here? We're going to break the cycle and I'm going to get my daughter some help. Well, really, because of my experience, I was in such a dark place. And uh, for many years, I was spiraling. So I have a twin sister who mm-hmm. witnessed my spiral. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, I, and in that dark place, uh, I didn't see hope or reasons for moving forward until I got pregnant with my daughter. Mm-hmm. So she became my light oh, and yes. my purpose. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so in parenting her and seeing that she started to struggle... I didn't want her to be in that dark place mm-hmm. and because I, I knew what it was like. And I wanted to do everything in my capacity to help her have a better experience so she doesn't go in her 20s and her 30s carrying things mm-hmm. and that she has a better opportunity of healing it now while she's young so that when she has her own family, they won't be burdened by mm-hmm. because uh, I take ownership that some of the hurt that I had experience in my teens, Mm -hmm. I brought into my mothering experience Mm -hmm. and I'm accountable Mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. I don't see my mothering experience as a failure Mm -hmm. because I wanted to do some things differently, Mm -hmm. but I take ownership 
that there were some things that happened to me Mm -hmm. that affected my children, Mm -hmm. period. Well, well, and let me add to that. First of all, again, I know a little bit about this just because your sister and I are friends and that's actually how we met, but very little. I don't want you to feel like she's Mm -hmm. talking about you or anything, but I have seen the growth (laughs) as well because uh, we were actually international in in South Africa, I believe, either when you had the baby or when you Mm -hmm. first, you know, whatever. And just to see that from over a decade to go to where you all are today, that's amazing. But I also want to say something else. I'm a parent too now, and we're, it's not perfect. We are not perfect. And one of the biggest things that we can contribute to our children is letting them know that. And let, yeah. cause, cause I think what we see, and I'm curious to hear from you, a lot of parents chalk it up to, well, I did the best I could, or, mm-hmm. you know, I tried, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And, and we know you tried, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like we, we, we get it. But you still did some damage. And I feel like being able to say that, you know, my my daughter is obviously a lot younger than yours. So if there are any mental health issues, you know, it's a little premature to tell that. But she'll, she's quick to let me know mm-hmm. if I discipline her and I'm wrong for that or if, mm-hmm. if, if any, you know what I mean? And, and it's so easy for me to say, well, I'm the mama. You know, I did the best I could with the information I had. Can you talk to our audience a little bit more about how important it is to be able to say, oh, man. I, I didn't know then. I know yes. now, and I want to get it right. It, it, and that's really what it is. And <laughs> it, I had this epiphany because my daughter is now 18. Mm-hmm. She is a freshman in college. Go, girl. And I love it. Thank you. I'm so blessed. <laughs> and that's a single mother right there who's now married, by the way, but she, uh-huh. you have done this. Like, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. She is her own walking testimony. Yes. So I, I play a little part in that. But mm-hmm. she, she's the reason why she is where she wow. is. But I sat with her and I apologized for the things that I didn't do just right. Mm-hmm. And I took accountability for that. And it was something that I've learned in this process because I got, I really believe I got into the mental health field, not only just to heal my family, but to heal other families. Oh, yeah. And in this work, I've been able to to do some work in, in my family, but then extend that education out to my community. Mm-hmm. And so I, I'm telling and I'm working with mothers and I'm saying it's okay to apologize to your child yes. when you don't get it right. Yes. To let them know that you are human and that sometimes you're going to do what you feel is best for them mm-hmm. with the information that, that you have. You have. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Period. And as you get more information, and you learn more, then you may change and evolve, but it's okay to take ownership. If that was the wrong call, mm-hmm. like if I said it the wrong way, if I did something the wrong way and, and take ownership to that. And that helped, that helps the young person to see when I become an adult, it's all right for me to also not be perfect. Absolutely. Because there is no manual for parenting. Yes. There's no book that says, go to page 67 to see how to deal with this situation. Right. right? right. So we do the best we can, right. but we also need to take ownership when we could have done things a little bit differently. Right. And mm-hmm. also really empathize with our children's experience yes. because it's their experience. Mm-hmm. So your perspective may be that what you did was what needed to be done, but your child may see it differently. And it's okay for your child to have a different perspective and you can keep your perspective but also ensure that that child feels like they're being heard Mm -hmm. and their perspective is also being respected and once I made that shift in my family there's a different dynamic that me and my daughter have now Mm -hmm. we're still a work in progress I tell people all the time I'm still her mother we are still working through things yes yes (laughs) yes so I'm not the expert Mm -hmm. in mothering Mm -hmm. however I've been able to learn through this work Mm -hmm. that there are things you can do to improve the relationship and we are improving our relationship each day and I'm able to help other families do that and do their work and and let parents see that it's okay to be accountable for things that you feel like you could have done a little differently. I love it. I love it. I I find myself often educating parents um, and caregivers, you know, or spouses or whatever and letting letting them know how important it is to do exactly what you said and how traumatic it is to do the exact opposite. And Uh I'm interested to hear from you 
it, it, do you see one of the things that I see is sometimes it is worse than the actual traumatic event mm-hmm. than to have somebody that you trust and you care about and you value that's where it boils down to is you value this person's opinion and this person tells you I don't believe you or mm-hmm. I did the best I could or mm-hmm. your perspective doesn't matter I mean a lot mm-hmm. of times especially in context of sexual assault I yes we talk very brief we, we talk a lot of my clients will open up and say this happened to me etc but it's the domino effect it's mm-hmm. mommy saying well you know you shouldn't have worn that you know, our daddy uh-huh. saying, well, why were you playing with him? You know, yeah. or what did you do to cause it? You know, mm-hmm. that is really what's harming our community. Would you agree? I definitely agree with that. And um, I've, I've done a lot of like trauma training. And one of the key things that you see when someone experiences something traumatic, it has a lot to do with their support mm-hmm. that they receive. Mm-hmm. So you can be in pretty challenging environments, experience really significant things, but if you have the right support and the right nurturing, yes. studies have shown yes, vast decrease in symptoms just based on that support. So experiencing that like sexual trauma, as we spoke of, mm-hmm. and having a family member there that's not supportive doesn't help Mm. and even if you as the parent do not believe the child it is not necessary to say that Mm -hmm. or even demonstrate Mm -hmm. that thought Mm -hmm. always act as if it happened so that the child feels that they can come to you Mm -hmm. when they need to come Mm -hmm. to you period Mm -hmm. but a lot of times I don't think that um, in our black families we have been educated on how harmful it can be <laughs> to say the things like well why were you wearing that mm-hmm. so why did you put yourself in that situation or uh it happened to me too mm-hmm. those are all very dismissive things mm-hmm. you're making the person who was harmed be responsible mm-hmm. for something that happened to them that was out of their control period period mm-hmm. it's the abuser mm-hmm. that's responsible mm-hmm. for their actions mm-hmm. not the person that's the victim mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's the education piece and, and, and we have like some historical kind of girl um, yes <laughs> things that we have said mm-hmm. to each other and our families that just keep going from one generation to the next like the what happens in a house stays, stays in the house, house. Mm-hmm. and I understand where it comes from but I also think that has hindered and, and caused a lot of people to carry a lot of hurt mm-hmm because they feel like they can't voice it Mm -hmm. Um, and like you said there's not enough of us out there really to voice it too you know because you can't Mm -hmm. tell it everywhere yeah exactly yeah and i'm I'm very transparent but i'm very cautious in my transparency Mm -hmm. so when i speak to clients i tell them it's it helps to be able to release it Mm -hmm. but you always have to pay attention to the environment Mm -hmm. and the purpose behind that release yes because there can be consequences yes. based on your transparency yes. and having a safe therapist we can go in the office shut a door and know that that person will hear what i have to say and it won't go mm-hmm. out of this room is so important mm-hmm. um, and so we definitely need more trained clinicians mm-hmm. uh, out in the field yes um, yeah most definitely wow you are really um blessing us with your insight today can we talk a little bit about history? You briefly touched on mm-hmm. some of the things that we say. What about yes. some of the, you know, behaviors? Or what about, okay, what about, one of the things that I see a lot of mm-hmm. is this. And it's very, and, that, mm-hmm. and that is traumatic, which is the, yep. the premises of this podcast, what we're trying to mm-hmm. address, those deep-seated mm-hmm. things. One of the things that I see, and I love my black men, this is not a jab at them. But uh-huh. first of all, what we're talking about, it happens in all communities. Sexual misconduct yes. and traumatic behaviors uh-huh. happens in all communities, okay? Uh-huh. But what uh-huh. I think we are struggling with is being able to acknowledge when somebody is being an offender and behaving uh-huh. in that way for fear that we might interrupt 
the black male narrative that black men are aggressive or black men mm-hmm. are are sexually deviant you know and the mm-hmm. statistics show that they, we are no more deviant than other populations mm-hmm. but most definitely yes but that doesn't mm-hmm. mean we haven't internalized those messages so i know for me mm-hmm. like in my church growing up one of the people was in the church and another mm-hmm. person was the child of a of a big doctor you know a mm-hmm. black doctor and it was like these people could never do these things uh, one of them mm-hmm. was a politician now my brain is just going so these people could never do these things because they're in this position, but it was happening. And uh-huh. I felt like the black community kind of made it harder for me to speak up because I was just a little child. You know, this thing was happening mm-hmm. to me. The politician, the only black politician in the area where I'm located, y'all do your research if you want to figure out who that is, but there's no way he could have been the person that was responsible for this. So what I'm saying is what types of I don't know. Can you speak on like why the black community, why we do that and why we, I guess, more or less how, how we indirectly in our effort to support the black piece. Sometimes mm-hmm. we have our children, our children are vulnerable. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know because that's a loaded question. OK, <laughs> if I could speak to all of it, but I'll, I'll give you some of my personal insights. OK, so I, I think one thing you said messaging. And, and messaging plays a huge part. And we're consistently getting messages thrown at us. Like, mm-hmm. um, I'm currently in Lynchburg, Virginia right now. Mm-hmm. And I watched the news last night here. Okay. And the news, the way that they portray the news is very different here in Lynchburg, Virginia than it is in Hampton Roads, Virginia. Okay. And messaging, messaging, messaging. Mm-hmm. The way that you see Black families portrayed on TVs, on um, media, messaging, messaging. So because we are bombarding as any other ethnicity that's watching this media Mm -hmm. we take that message in but we also Mm -hmm. have this internal conflict because we are also black and we Mm -hmm. know that that is not 100 family and the way the media does it so okay always wanting to come out of i feel like this messaging that's false messaging Mm -hmm. and we feel if we speak to some of the truth of the message. Yes, yes, yes. It is causing 10 steps back. Yes. Actually, as a community, we need to combat the truth in the messaging Mm because some of it is truth. But Mm -hmm. also some of the other layers of things that the messaging talk about. Like they don't talk about the big income gap that we have um, in the black community and how they become black. Um, income gap significantly affects our abilities to have housing, to have yes. employment, to have the resources we need to deal with some of the things that cause us to be in certain situations. Like mm-hmm. the example you gave, I thought about the income disparity there. This politician, yes. this person with money, this person yes. with absolutely can't be seen as someone who's harmful. Mm-hmm. And then also I'd have to go back to education because we seem to think that those who offend must be the scary boogeyman yes. down the street. Yes. And that's not that the is case. not please there Yes, let's emphasize this. Way. Please, 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 if you are listening. Uh, I read an article as many as nine out of ten childhood survivors of sexual trauma comes from the family or someone that you trust. So what we're consistently doing is we're teaching our children to be fearful of the 10% that, you know, there are Mm -hmm. 10% of cases it's a stranger, you know, or somebody that you don't know, Mm -hmm. but we're completely disregarding the 90% of who you do know. Most And and that's so incredibly dangerous. And a lot of it has to do with proximity and just being close. I mean, Mm -hmm. who else? I mean, first of all, Ain't no stranger really getting access to my child. Like, I know exactly where they are right now. I know who's keeping them. I'm paying Mm -hmm. them, so they better do what I tell them to do. You know, like, it's so, yeah. So it's very important to be able to to understand that thoroughly when you're letting Mm -hmm. your children, as your children exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and to teach your children their own unique individual safety of self. So I learned with my daughter that I couldn't protect her from everybody. So because I was uh, assaulted by 
a male mm-hmm. who was an adult. I protected my daughter vigilantly around right. men who right. were adults. Right, got it. If I dated someone, I would threaten. <laughs> I would be like, if you touch I my daughter. I will kill you. <laughs> it's, it was death. That's just what it is, yeah. right? But I didn't think about the children. And so, oh, like, mm-hmm. uh, little kids assault other yes, little they kids. Do. There's no gender to mm-hmm. this thing. There's no age to this thing. There's no race mm-hmm. to this thing. There are offenders all over the place and you really have to teach your children how to keep themselves mm-hmm. safe how to know that no kid no cousin no loved one should be touching mm-hmm. you in mm-hmm. certain places or also teaching them the grooming mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. techniques so that they are aware when someone's grooming them to do something that's not appropriate Absolutely. Um, and starting mm-hmm. young I, I really tell people stop waiting for your kids to get big enough to hear, hear about the yes. birds and bees before you start talking yes. to them about sexual abuse it's, it's too late. late they need mm-hmm. to know young they mm-hmm. need to know young not and, and age appropriate yeah. for sure making sure it's age appropriate but also having that dialogue when they're young so they understand mm-hmm. that people should not be touching them in certain mm-hmm. ways and uh, and they're able to identify when someone's right. blaming them that's very good that? uh, I, and I, I can't thank you enough for your transparency I'll also share you know my daughter's four I've talked about her in the podcast many times and one of the things that we do is we have this saying um, you don't touch mm-hmm. butt you don't touch milkies because mm-hmm. I nurse her so we call her milkies and we don't touch people mm-hmm. and she will say that mm-hmm. and recite that so she's very clear and she's only four years old she doesn't really know what that mm-hmm. means but she knows yep. that it, whatever it is that's my personal space and you're not allowed to touch mm-hmm. there and, and a quick funny story is one day and I, and I tell everybody you know like everybody like knows that about us if you keep my daughter and one day my daughter was on the playground with her nanny and her nanny was uh she was trying to I guess climb the monkey bars and it was you know her nanny just kind of needed to push her up and it was convenient to push her up on mm-hmm. her butt you know what I mean it wasn't anything mm-hmm. inappropriate but my daughter was just very quick to say no we don't touch butt, mm-hmm. we don't touch milky, we don't touch pee-pee. And the um, nanny actually came home and also, it told me too, just in case, you know, because she knew mm-hmm. my daughter was going to tell me. And, you know, we were able, but, but I want, like, basically what I'm trying to say is I want that narrative. That near, that conversation mm-hmm. should be safe. And if you're, yeah. keep, if you're allowing your children to be around people where they might be offended by something like that or... You know, why, you know, I've always said it in sleepovers, like for you, just in case you want my kids to sleep over at your house, you know, you need to know, I need to know who's going to be there, where are the adults going to sleep, where are the children going to sleep, for how long, etc. I need to be very clear about those arrangements. And if you feel like I'm asking too many details or, you know, you're giving too much information, that that's a telltale sign for me that, you know, that this isn't safe. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, because I think that parents should all feel that way do you kind of think that's important as well i I totally agree i'll tell because i work with a lot of teens and i tell the parents and preteens that you need to know your teens and your preteens friends parents Mm -hmm. and and not just know their name and where they live kind of know these people yes Uh, because these are the people who are also shaping your child's thoughts and perceptions about life mm-hmm. just as much as you are shaping it they are shaping it mm-hmm. and you want to know uh, for safety what these people are thinking and, and how they operate and spend some time with the, your kids friends and get to know them too and also keep that dialogue open so your young people your children know what I need to look out for mm-hmm. in these different environments so yes I, I 100% agree it's a lot of work mm-hmm. as you know, when I speak uh, sometimes I, I get parents pushed back. When do I have time to do that? Mm-hmm. You have to make time. Yes. You just have to make time. That's just what it is. Be um, intentional about it. I mean, okay. you can do this if your kid is young while you're brushing teeth, you know, mm-hmm. at night when you are bedtime story time, you know, mm-hmm. um, under ride to school in the morning, you know, yes. like you, 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 at prayer time when you're saying your prayers before grace, you mm-hmm. know, um, there are a variety of ways, but this is this is very important. One thing I think people I see a lot is people think that if they talk about this, that they're going to expose their children to sexual behavior. But uh-huh. but first of all, first of all, somebody's going to expose them to it, whether you do or not. Uh-huh. 
<laughs> and also the research shows that it actually delays sexual like promiscuity it you mm-hmm. know because a lot of times they're curious yeah i mean let's be real a lot of what you know we're sec we are sexualizing things like there's a, a picture of like a coca-cola bottle where there's a piece of ice up there and the ice is in the shape of a woman's body you know it goes mm-hmm. you know so a little kid is drinking that probably doesn't have that awareness but they're getting you know they're getting and then and then let alone us saying things like well boys will be boys or Mm -hmm. you know my son is nursing so someone might say get it boy or something like that like something to Mm -hmm. encourage those type of sexual behaviors and they don't know what to do with them yeah and the message is even in like the cartoons yes I, I, i sat down and watched disney and I, the the just the messaging in some of the Disney shows yes. that that's there. So yes, it, it, I hope that a parent who hears this podcast mm-hmm. will take that they should not allow the environment to teach their children no. about that part of life, about mm-hmm. sexuality, about keeping yourself safe. Don't allow the environment to do that for your children. Mm-hmm. You need to be the person that shares that knowledge with them and make sure it's age appropriate and if you need help their resources i tell people you can google just about anything Mm -hmm. now you have so many resources right before our hands Mm -hmm. so if you're not sure how to start the conversation look there are books children's books that you can now buy and read to your children that will help you with the dialogue Mm -hmm. about sexuality and safety and all these different things so there's no excuse to allow the environment to give your children that messaging because they need to hear from you mm-hmm. the truth to help limit their ability to get into some really bad situations because mm-hmm. if a 10 year old is getting all their advice from other 10 year olds <laughs> have 10 year old wisdom yes period yes and for parents who are so oblivious and think this stuff isn't happening like i've had a nine-year-old looking at pornography in the uh-huh. schools, you know, cause they give you these little iPads a lot of the yep. times and all you gotta do is type some stuff in and you're in there. Even when it has a child lock on it, you know, uh-huh. like we can get around it. So if you're, you're, yeah, it's very important to have the conversation. Danielle, I'm, I'm gonna ask you a couple more questions and then we're gonna uh-huh. get to um, our what's good segment. Um, right. But in terms of a history, we're talking about generational curses And we briefly spoke about, you know, and this was before, you know, we started recording, but, you know, our history has some ugly sexual innuendos, too. And Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, how do you think the influence of maybe the shame of that or the guilt of that or the discomfort with that kind of plays into some of the blurred boundaries that we have with sexual contact today? I I definitely think it's it's impactful. also to add the piece that typically you are harmed by someone you know love and trust Mm -hmm. so layers Mm -hmm. so we have the historical stuff we have our loved ones whom we trust or people that we have in our lives that do these things and there's this conflict so um, specifically because I do a lot of work with young people uh, they're not able to compartmentalize things Mm -hmm. so it's really difficult for a young person to to know that this is my uncle Mm -hmm. and uh, my uncle my family loves my uncle yes and he's part of my family and i love my uncle but my uncle does these things Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. so because we have all these layers we we have to be tackling it in lots of different approaches Mm -hmm. because it's there we Mm -hmm. can't change the history Mm -mm. We, we can't change the things that have happened and but we can't change what's happening right now. Mm-hmm. We could do some things a little different. And mm-hmm. one thing is prevention. Yes. Mm-hmm. Educating our kids so that they understand what to look for, how to keep themselves safe. And mm-hmm. then the next piece is really in a black community, being very comfortable with understanding that yes, there is growth and progress in our community. Mm-hmm. But if we don't continue to speak to some of the things that are hindering us, yes. we won't be successful. No, we won't. And we really need to be comfortable with identifying. And I think part of it is not making it feel like it's just us. Right. Like you said earlier, all ethnicities Mm -hmm. have these same issues to a degree. Yes. We just have other issues on top of these Mm -hmm. issues 
that make it really challenging to resolve it because we're also struggling with, like you said, racism, Mm -hmm. the income disparities, Mm -hmm. the lack of resources, Mm -hmm. all those things also make it a little bit more Mm -hmm. challenging. So we have to collectively accept sometimes that there are some issues. Yeah. We need to work on them. Yes. But we can do the work. Yes. Are there particular, are there any signs that parents might look for? Because when you mentioned the uncle, you know, one of the things that came to my mind was a lot of times in my practice, I've seen maybe if, you know, the person being maybe extra nice to the child Mm -hmm. or, you know, requesting alone time with the child. Was there anything that you see that really stands out um, that parents can look for if something like this might be happening? Yeah, those are all grooming tactics. Things mm-hmm. like um, having little kids come sit on your lap, yes. rough playing with them, yes. tickling them, mm-hmm. forcing kids to kind of hug and Gosh, kiss Gosh, I people. hate that. Yes. Um, you see, when I was growing up, I wouldn't want to hug, and my grandma would be, I would get in trouble if I didn't hug yeah. people. You know, and I'm like, I don't want to hug you. <laughs> and, and, and that's some, there's some cultural things there, too. Yes. And, and mm-hmm. I get it. I understand. Uh, but I think that we're in a time now where we really have to pay attention to those mm-hmm. those cultural things that are not helpful in other areas. And Absolutely. Those are all grooming tactics. Yes, and, I love it. Uh, someone who wants to abuse someone is, is happy to take those cultural things mm-hmm. and utilize it for mm-hmm. bad things. So. I say pay attention to those things, uh, really at having that open dialogue with your kids so that they can talk to you about things that make you feel uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. One thing I, I t- tell uh, any kid that comes to me, follow your instinct. Mm-hmm. If instinctually you feel something ain't right, mm-hmm. listen to that. Yes. Listen to that thing that says it ain't right and, and get yourself out of that situation. Yes. And parents support your child when they do that. Mm-hmm. You know, they might not have the language to say mm-hmm. Uncle Johnny feels like a creep. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? But they know how they feel when they're around them. And mm-hmm. by not permitting your child to do that, you're telling your child that their opinion doesn't matter and yep. that they don't have agency over their body. And that sets mm-hmm. them up for adult relationships, you know, where they feel like they don't have any control. And that's really yep. when we start seeing a lot of problems. Agreed. Yes. Danielle, are there any myths surrounding this issue? And we've kind of indirectly (laughs) discussed Mm -hmm. them, but Mm -hmm. we haven't actually used the word. But is Mm -hmm. there any myths that, you know, about this topic, whether it's sexual trauma or just trauma in general that you think is important to address that we hold in the Black community? I think the biggest one, and I won't won't say it as as a myth, but I'll say it's a challenge that we... Mm -hmm. We think we could just pray everything away. Girl. <laughs> we, we tend to um, say that you know, just just pray about it. If you yeah. if you're if you're hurting, then that means you're not trusting God. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that there there's a very significant piece of religion. I am Christian. I 100 yes. percent believe in prayer. I also yes. believe that God trained us and educated yes. us to also help with things to use along with prayer. Yes, and we can't just take people who are really hurting and significantly dealing with complicated trauma Mm -hmm. and just say pray it away no exactly Um, because when they pray and it doesn't go away then they feel like now well my relationship with god isn't strong enough because it's just not healed yeah when there there are things you can do along with prayer it's a holistic approach to Mm -hmm. healing so Mm -hmm. we want to tackle the mind body and soul so this myth that we need to just pray Yes. Um, Pray and and see therapy. Wow. Amazing. Pray to ask God for a therapist. How about that? (laughs) And keep looking till you get one. Yes. So please don't feel like if I go to someone a couple of times and it's not a good fit, that all therapists are bad. You have to do some work sometimes to find that person that fits. Yes, absolutely. And this is something I can just add real quickly. You know, we're starting off on this podcast. So at the time that it airs, I don't know where we're going to be, but we have our own directory. So please, by all means, if you look on the directory in your state and you don't see a therapist, then email me, contact me, let me know, and I'll try to find one for you because it's it's really that important. Yeah. All right. Now uh, we're going to go into a segment of the show that's called What's Good. Okay. Mm-hmm. What's Good is a part of the show where we apply this information that we discussed today 
for that could be that could happen in a real life scenario for our listeners. So are you ready? Yes. Okay. Meet Chantel. Chantel is a 27 year old African American woman. She has one child from a previous relationship and is in a serious relationship currently. She finds that she wants to get married and have more children with the man that she is currently. But she struggles in the area of intimacy. She's never told anyone, but as a child, her mom's boyfriend used to molest her on a weekly basis. When her mother found out that her boyfriend had done this to another child, she kicked him out of the house, but never asked Chantel if it happened to her. She's been holding on to this secret for over 20 years. How would you suggest she proceed? Mm. Well, I'm, I'm feeling for her because yeah. I can I can relate. Mm-hmm. I would definitely want her to seek out some support mm-hmm. and uh, really be able to process what happened to her because I can 100% say that it is showing up in her relationships. relationships. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely showing up probably with a child that she's already parenting. Mm-hmm. And, and it's likely showing up in that intimate relationship, but also affecting other functions of life. Mm-hmm. And she wants to do the work, so I would commend her. I'm really big on congratulating people for taking the first step of seeking out some help. Yes. And so she would receive all kinds of praise and positive regard for me for mm-hmm. wanting to do something a little different. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would want her to tackle on that abuse head first. Amazing. And that's, I, I'm really big. I like uh, narrative therapy. I like to write. Mm-hmm. Um, I, music is thing. So I do a lot of music therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I would tell her, you know, t- you can tap into gro- healing this in a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. And you want to come seek some support so we can figure out what's the best way for you to heal what happened to you so that it won't continue to affect your current relationship Mm -hmm. um, significantly. You may not agree, but I believe when you experience certain levels of trauma, it will always show up in some form or fashion in your life. mm -hmm. I absolutely agree. Yes, but the significance that it shows up you get to determine that yes you do and there's some things that you can do um so so i don't co-sign the 100 percent healed from sexual right. abuse i feel like i i carry it for the rest of my life yeah it's who, life. My, yeah. Of my it's who i am it's who yep. i am it's yeah part of me but i get to decide how much that experience will impact my current relationships and so for chantelle i would in, encourage her um help her figure out what it is that she needs to do to heal that um, so that she can move on and, and, and be a little bit uh, transparent and letting her know that, that you, you can heal from that. And I, I know firsthand, like I'm happily married. Yeah. Very good. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. I appreciate yes, it. Yes. And congratulations on just the work that you're doing. Um, before I let you go, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much. Your wisdom has inspired me and I know it will my listeners but I'm sure uh, they're also going to want to follow you as I do as well. So how can someone listening be able to get in contact with you? I, I appreciate it. You can find me on social media through the healing space. Okay. And the healing space is located in Virginia. So that's where I practice in, in the state of Virginia. And you can also lo- locate me on Instagram at Achievable Great. Um, so website is www.my healing dot space got it and instagram again is at achievable and great fantastic danielle it has been a pleasure to interview you today i'm telling you from the bottom of my heart i got chills with your vulnerability and your open authenticity and just your uh, uh, knowledge about this subject matter i know my listeners will as well thank you thank you Thank you, and it's been a pleasure to interview you today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate this opportunity. And like I said, I'm talking about it, so I could talk about trauma all day. Girl, well, maybe we'll have to bring you back. <laughs> I, would, I would love to come back. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Black Marriage and Family Therapy Matters podcast, where we connect Black families to Black therapist. Since you've listened all the way through, come on in and join the family. If you haven't done so yet, 
please join our free community where we offer weekly trainings and monthly giveaways. We can be found on Facebook under the Black Marriage and Families Matter Facebook group. And since you're serious about joining our family, we also invite you to join our All In campaign, which signifies your commitment to go all in, not only for yourself, but in helping us reach more people by downloading this podcast wherever you are listening to it, leaving us a review, and subscribing to our YouTube channel. This really helps us reach more people and change more lives. After all, Dr. Martin Luther King once said, we can all get more done together than we can apart. With that said, I want to encourage you to share this episode with just three other people who you think might also benefit from our community and what we are offering with the hopes that all of you can join our All In campaign. When you're done, simply click the link All In Campaign in the bio and receive a free copy of my course entitled Goodbye Toxicity, which is valued at $297. This course will help you to work through some of the difficult experiences that arise in most of our relationships, and it's completely free to you with your commitment to join our All In Campaign. We look forward to connecting with you every Monday and Wednesday. Thanks for listening.